call the meeting to order. My name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the board and the date is January 19th, 2021. So what I'll do next is um, introduce the other members of the board. Um, you can unmute and say hello, starting with Joe. Hello, I'm Joe. <laughs> and Rob. Hello, I'm Rob. Rob Goodwin, thanks. Roger Kranz. Hi. And then we have Kevin. Greetings. Kevin, our vice chair. Gene. Hello. Hello, Gene. And I expect we may be joined by another um, board member or two. Um, we'll do introductions and welcome for the- hey, Kate, this is Michael. This is Roger. I'm, I'm on the call. Oh, okay, Michael. Thank you. Can you relabel that, Meredith? Yep, that's what I'm doing right now. I was going to okay. wait till I could see if it was him or not. Okay. And Michael, a board member, is here as well. Thanks for clarifying that. Today, you are still electric department, but soon you will be Michael Azorchuk. Right, un unofficially, yeah. Oh, there you are. <laughs> no problem. Okay, great. Um, so what we, were, what we will do next, I'm going to turn it over to Meredith, who's going to review our meeting procedures uh, for this, particularly for the benefit of anyone who may be watching on ORCA who is also here recording the meeting. Okay. So, um, I know that there are several members of the public on tonight in, in addition to our um, applicants. So I'm gonna go through the full spiel tonight. Um, so first for anyone watching this meeting via ORCA, if you're watching there and then you decide you do want to participate, you can use this Zoom meeting link here to get in. You can also call into the meeting using this phone number. And then here's your meeting ID and the password is over here. You might, I don't know if Orca needs to move its little window or not. I'm hoping it can show. Um, and if you're having problems accessing the e meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. Um, so in addition to emailing me, if you have pro problems accessing the meeting, once you're in the meeting, if you're having difficulties with the video conferencing features, you can use the chat function in Zoom. Um, please keep that to, um, you know, technical issues. Don't provide comments on actual applications that way. Um, although if that does happen, that'll become part of the public record. Um, the Zoom meeting is being recorded as well as streamed live via ORCA. Turning on your video is optional. All public testimony will be taken verbally. Um, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking to reduce background noise. And for anyone participating by phone, you can also use star six, which will not only mute your phone, but also do a little flag on Zoom to show that you're muted so that we know what's going on. Um, if you're interested in speaking on a particular matter and weren't able to say what matter you wanted to speak on at the beginning when you first logged in, um, then please raise your hand when that matter has come up on the agenda. You can either do that physically if you're on video or you can use the raise hand button on your toolbar. If you're calling in on the phone, you can press star nine to do that. Um, and if for some reason that's all not working, there's a pause in the discussion. You can unmute yourself and state your name and just ask to talk and we'll, we'll figure it all out. Um, once the chair has recognized you to participate, participate, please unmute your microphone, confirm that you can be heard. And the first time you speak, please make sure to provide your full name and address for the record. Um, we ask that you keep your initial comments to two minutes. Um, the DRB members will have the opportunity to respond to those comments or to ask questions of you. The applicant may also have an opportunity to respond to any questions or comments. The chair may grant additional time for speakers who have follow-up questions or comments, but then once you're finished, we ask that you please mute your microphone. Um, the chair will then probably move on to somebody else. You do have the option to ask to speak again on either the same matter or a later matter. Um, in the event the public is unable to access this meeting, it will be continued to a time or place certain. If you are having connectivity issues, try turning off the video and just having the audio function or closing other applications that you might have open on your phone or computer. Um, and then also if you, 
want to download the full meeting packet with all the items that will be shown on screen share plus additional, there's this link here where you can go and download the full meeting agenda. Um, and that's also just if you're having problems viewing the screen share, if you're at home on ORCA, you can go there and pull everything up. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting that are not unanimous will be done by roll call vote in accordance with the law. I'm gonna now hand this back over to Kate. All right, thanks Meredith for that overview. All right, so what we will do next, next item on our agenda is item number four, which is approval of the agenda. So I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Um, you're on mute, but I think I saw a motion by Kevin. Is there a second? Second. And yes, you did. Great. Working on the lip reading. That works fine. Great. I will call the roll um, on, the mo on the motion that has been made to approve the agenda. Joe? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Rob? Did I get you there, Rob? Yes, I saw a yes. Roger? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we've approved our agenda. Thank you. Um, the next agenda item is comments for the chair. From the chair, um, I do not have any comments. So we'll move on to item six, which is the approval of our minutes from January 4th. And those who are present tonight who are eligible to vote are myself, Kevin, Rob, Michael, Roger, and Jean. So um, having reviewed the minutes, are there any corrections or modifications to the minutes? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the minutes from Jean. Is there a second? Second. Second from Roger. Okay, of those eligible to vote, Kevin. Yes. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Roger? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I also vote yes. We've approved the minutes of January 4th. All right, moving on to the business before us this evening. So the first item of business on our agenda is 2996 Elm Street, and this is final plan review of a two lot subdivision. Pull up my documents here. Um, so anyone who's wishing to participate in this, if they could please um, join the meeting uh, visually if that if they would like um, and be ready to unmute otherwise. Okay, just pulling up my documents. Great. So all right, so the applicant is uh, Rob Scott. And I want to confirm that Rob is on the there's Rob. Great. Um, welcome Rob. Welcome back. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so we first heard from you, um, I think a month, uh, December, at the end of December. And we, are, we, um, we have reviewed this application under sketch plan review, which was an opportunity to look at the proposal and walk through what information may have been missing or what things board members wanted more clarification on. And based on that review, um, you've come back with a final subdivision proposal for a second lot at um, 2996 Elm. So um, I think that what I would like to do, that, for, first I will ask, is there anyone to be heard on this application? Okay, so in that case, what I will do um, is I will swear you in, Rob. So um, do you, do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, I do. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. All right. So um, I think what I'd like to do is have Meredith give any updates that um, are pertinent for her to deliver, and then I'll turn it over to you, Rob Scott, to, to tell us, um, uh, to update us on your application, and then we'll walk through the staff report. So starting with Meredith. Um, I'm... I'm not sure I have much of an update per se. I mean, you kind of described the application for anybody who's watching via ORCA and 
um, is interested in this. This is a two lot subdivision of a parcel that's out in the rural district headed out of Montpelier towards the north. Um, and there are no plans at this point for further development of the what will be the new lot two um, that is set further back from Elm Street. Um, and you know my my review of the additional materials that were brought in, as you can see in the staff report, it seems like all the information we need is here. You need is here to decide on the subdivision. I didn't find any any holes. Um, and it looked like Rob, in my my view, answered all the questions that were asked during sketch plan. But that is up for for you all to debate. Okay, great. Thanks, Meredith. And um, Rob, is there anything? Rob Scott, <laughs> is there anything that um, you'd like to share with us about new information or um, that you've added since since we first talked? Any highlights? We will still go through the staff report, but this is a just a chance for you to give an overview if you'd like. Sure. Um, I've had, uh, uh, according to state uh, permit, permitting requirements, I had uh, three test holes dug on the existing three parcel site, um, which will go with the existing home and uh, soil analyzed and uh, came back excellent. And uh, the septic design for that is in the process and uh, will be hopefully submitted to the state tomorrow or the following day. Um, so I'll have to wait on that approval uh, to proceed with the, I'm not really sure how this uh, will, I guess they file it with the state and then the state will email me and then uh, perhaps move ahead with uh, some trying to sell the house. So, it's, okay. uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that all went very well. Um, and, uh, but th that's it as far as uh, new developments. Great, thanks. Thanks for that update. Um, one of our jobs, e even if there's not a specific proposal before us at the time we review a subdivision, it's our job to make sure that we're not allowing the creation of funky lots that can't be developed. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we ask some of these questions about, about access and about um, septic suitability and things like that. Well, great. All right. So. Um, if it pleases the board, what we will do is we will look at the staff report, um, go through and confirm that we have the evidence that we need to, um, to review this. Does that work for you, board members? All right, very good, good nods. All right, great. Um, so it's an existing 12-acre uh, site, as we've heard, and the proposal is to um, subdivide into two lots, one with an existing house and one that is, is undeveloped. So starting with our general standards, um, we look at our use dimensional standards and accessory structure standards. These are hard to apply. These cannot be applied because there is not a specific development proposal before us. But what we can confirm is that for the rural district, the parcel being created has the potential to meet all of the standards um, and there are uses that can take place on it. Okay. Um, one of the one of the questions and things that we discussed last time is, of course, when we create a parcel, you want to make sure it's accessible from the road, not landlocked. And it sounds like it is still the case that the access is going to be Veo, it's Veo Road, right? Um, which is a class four town highway. Yeah, Veo. Veo, Veo. I knew I'd get that wrong. Thank you. Um, and it sounds like in in the event that this parcel is developed, um, it may need to be upgraded in order to meet public works requirements. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the road will need development and uh, I will work with the DPW um, to do that. Yes. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, all right, so then the next section is regarding demolition, which is not relevant to this application. Um, section 3005 is riparian areas. And there is a stream forming the southwestern boundary. And Meredith, could you help us? Um, is, is the best place to view that stream on page five of the staff report, the slopes map? Would you say that gives us a, a good snapshot of the stream relative to the, the existing parcel? Um, I actually think, and this is a little awkward, sorry. I actually think sorry. the best place to view it is on 
page 11 of the staff report, which is page 15 of the packet. Okay. Um, there is an image capture from the ANR Atlas. It's a little small. I can pull it up and zoom in on the, the screen share if you want. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Let's see, I said page 15. So again, there's not a building, there's not a, a structure being proposed, um, but I think what we need to be able to confirm as a board is that the parcel is developable with the appropriate um, buffer for the stream. Is that right, Meredith? Okay. And so Veo Road is over here, mm -hmm. right? And then the stream is this thin blue line here along the southern boundary of the property. And this is also where the steeper slopes are on that slopes map um, that you saw on page five. Okay. So the flatter area is here where it's most likely to be developed along Veo Road or okay. Veo Road. I right. can also point out that on the uh, survey plot in the subdivision, the southerly boundary of the property is the stream. And so you can kind of see uh, more detail of where that is and whatnot. So. Yep. Thank you, Rob Goodwin. Just a, just a general question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Meredith, how far out does the city uh, water and sewer extend uh, on Elm Street? I mean, it's not here. No, I, can... I know that. Um, I can I can get that map pulled up separately and pull that up. I thought you might know it right off the top of your head. No, just I don't that's know your off the top of my head. I, I looked when this discussion, you know, when this application first came in. It's quite a ways back. Okay. It's near the um, it's near Turtle Island. Uh, yeah, is it okay? I, yeah, I think yeah. it stops. It used to stop at North Park Drive, um, right near the recreational facility. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. Yeah, just more spread out after that. Okay, good. Well, that just thanks for showing us that stream. Just gives us a reference point, um, especially for a little bit later in, yeah. in the application. Um, but again, nothing is being proposed right now. Um, so moving on to 3006, wetlands and vernal pools are not documented on the natural resources inventory for Montpelier. So we do not see those on this parcel. Um, Moving on to steep slopes, there are some that are greater than 25%, uh, which would, uh, which are indicated on the map. Um, but the, the more easily developed area is um, the one that we just discussed. Um, and so there's no proposal to, to develop on slopes. Similarly with erosion control and stormwater management, um, we, we cannot assess those impacts because, or, there are no impacts because there's no development being being proposed. Correct. Okay. All right. So um, any questions about any of those from board members before we move on? Okay. I don't think it's necessarily prudent to point out uh, at this time related to conditions. However, the I think Vio Road does have some steep slopes, um, you know, coming in there. And you know, when it gets upgraded, I think you know, there there may trigger some some other stuff. Um, related to uh, drainage and whatnot, but um, I, I don't see it as an issue for the subdivision itself. Okay, but that's never, nevertheless good to good to get out there. Thanks, thanks, Rob. All right, um, so section thirty ten is access and circulation. Um, it's the the plate. It's a it's an existing road. It is within. It meets the requirements for spacing uh, with other roads and driveways, but as we've as we've discussed and as the staff report notes, um, any upgrades to Vare Road, the Class Four Town Owned Road, are going to need to be um, approved by City Council. And as the applicant has said, that would be um, something he understands and would pursue with with Public Works. Okay. Um, parking and loading areas. Um, I believe it complies with this because there's going to be off street, off Elm Street parking and nine, nine acres available. All right, any questions about those general standards before we move on to the specific subdivision standards? All right, thank you. 
So um, the first has to do with the capacity of community facilities and utilities. And this is this is a two lot subdivision, like most likely developed as another home, but we're considering as a board whether local schools, police, fire, ambulance, infrastructure, street infrastructure, maintenance, parks and recreation, et cetera, will, will be adversely impacted. Um, and we have received a narrative from the applicant saying that the subdivision would not affect these things adversely. Um, or sorry, it's not adverse. The standard is, will it cause a disproportionate or unreasonable burden on community facilities and utilities? Um, and I, I think that that is rational, that uh, the likelihood of a single family home, or even if there were four units on that property um, which is not being proposed, which is just hypothetical, um, the likelihood of a disproportionate or unreasonable impact is, is slim. But um, if board members have some questions or want to discuss that further, we, we can. Or if, if Rob Scott wants to add anything too beyond what's in the narrative. I'm good. Um, yeah, I believe that uh, if there is development up there, um, it would probably be a single home, single family home. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, so then we're gonna move on to section 3503, which is suitability of the land. We wanna make sure the land can be used without endangering public health and safety, and that we're not creating a parcel that is hazardous. Um, so we've discussed steep slopes and the fact that there are non-steep slopes that can be developed on and that parcel two can be developed with, within these standards. Um, the stream would not impede the development. And as I said, we've talked about slopes. So I think, I think the land is suitable. Section 3504 is traffic, um, which is, we, we don't have a specific use, so we can't ascertain what the comings and goings would include. However, um, as Meredith wisely points out, given the limited types of development on this parcel, it is unlikely that we're going to see a very intense traffic use. Um, so that, that makes sense. And any questions about traffic? Okay. So design and configuration of parcel boundaries. Um, this is to, to make sure that we're kind of replicating the pattern in the area and not creating awkwardly sized properties. Um, number of standards here that uh, staff recommends we find are met. Um, we've avoided a flag shaped lot. We are in, including ac there is access off of a road. Um, they're at right angles. The lines are at right angles where possible. We're not creating dog legs and things like that. Um, questions about the lot configuration. All right, design and layout of necessary improvements. Um, this is something we go through though. Sometimes some of these standards are more suited to larger subdivisions. We'll just, we'll check them. Um, streets, not applicable, not being built. Pedestrian and bike, bicycle facilities um, do not have any internal changes uh, that would trigger this. Water and wastewater facilities um, the applicant must demonstrate compliance with or the ability to comply with the state's wastewater system and potable water supply rules. And um, we heard just now from you, Rob, Rob Scott, that the, that the land, is, you're, you've, you've tested the land and you're finding that it perks. I think is what we heard you say. I have tested um, the three acre parcel. Okay. Uh, and that soil came back excellent. Uh, uh, there is suitable, you know, a similar, um, no, I'm not sure I haven't dug, I haven't done any test pits on the nine acre parcel. Um, but, uh, it, it's an old gravel pit, I believe. Um, they, they I think they skimmed about 10 or 12 feet of gravel off the upper field to uh, help rebuild route 12 hmm. many years ago. Um, but, uh, there is another section that has, you know, soil, um, a lot of soil it's it's wooded i you know i don't have any um any fears that it wouldn't perk in one of many type of septic designs available today but uh mm -hmm. 
Um, I know there's a uh, area suitable for it. Yeah, it's very, very large, probably a three acre flat um, parcel up there. Okay. Uh, so. And the site would, would also be able to meet the state's potable water supply rules because it's not on town water. It would have its own well, is that? Right, yeah. Um, neighbors, uh, they are in Middlesex, um, just uphill, probably 500 feet from the f open field area where a house might be built. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a, a well. I think they dug 250 feet for it, but um, we're at the bottom of East Hill. Um, mm -hmm. so there is ample water that does flow down during the spring times. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident that there would be water available. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Any questions about that from board members? Well, I just want I, one question. Correct me if I'm wrong, but so you're applying for a wastewater permit, um, just for the three acre parcel, um, and deferring the design and permitting of the nine acre parcel. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So in order, as, as far as meeting this standard, you are, you are attesting to the ability to comply with the state's wastewater system and potable supply rules, even though you don't have those permits in hand. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, pri public and private utilities, um, no plans for development currently. We've talked about septic systems and drilled wells and finding those things. Oh, I got ahead of myself before, so sorry to make you repeat what you had written in your narrative. <laughs> Thanks for, it's for our benefit to hear it, you hear you say it. Um, okay, so public and private utilities we've just discussed and they will be provided. Um, and then that brings us to landscaping. Applicants shall design the subdivision to maximize the preservation of existing mature vegetation and provide additional landscaping as necessary to meet certain certain goals. And the, the, the parcel is mostly forested now. Is that correct? Um, there's a mixture of uh, forest and uh, open meadow. Okay. Um, I've been cutting the lawn up there for a few years uh, to kind of you know, propose a, uh, a building site or, you know, a place to picnic basically is all I've been doing with it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but there's about three, I would say three plus acres of flat, um, open land. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there's, a there's a lot of, um, space, um, and there's a couple of beautiful sites for home as if somebody's going to build a home up there, um, without really disturbing any vegetation. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what the flora and fauna was, but, uh, you know, it was, it, it would grow up every year and then it would flatten down and, you know, be a lawn the next year, basically. Um, okay. All right. So um, one thing I want to ask is whether you would be um, open to a condition of, of final subdivision approval that would require any for any future development application to include a landscaping plan, just to make sure that once something is actually built, these these requirements of the subdivision bylaw are are met. Would you be open to a condition? And, and you may not even be the person who ultimately. Right, I would. Yes. You wouldn't. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. So then. Um, all right, there are no parks and recreation areas in your two lot subdivision because <laughs> that tends not to be the case. Um, monuments and parcel corner markers are indicated on the final plan. Um, and construction and maintenance of necessary improvements is, is, um, does not apply to this, this scale of, of subdivision. All right, so we've talked about the landscaping plan. That brings us um, toward the end of the standards. Um, Section 3507, character of the neighborhood and settlement pattern. Um, this takes a larger parcel and puts it into two, but in doing so, I, I believe remains consistent with the rural, relatively rural nature um, of, of this district, mostly residential, does not involve quality farmland or floodplain, um, and it seems compatible with the rights Wrightsville Reservoir neighborhood, um, but DRB members, do you have any any questions about how this how this fits in with the area or any concerns you'd like to raise? 
All right, thanks. Um, and then section 3508 has to do with renewable energy and energy conservation um, to ensure that um, direct sun sunlight remains available to, to buildings on these parcels. Um, and given the size of the parcel and the location of the building, any future building relative to existing building, um, they're not going to overlap on each other's sunshine. Okay. Any questions about energy, renewable? Thanks. Energy, comma, renewable, and energy, comma, conservation. Great. Um, so that brings us to natural resource protection. Um, and this is where we talk a little bit more about the, um, the stream. There, there are a few items on the, on the parcel. So there's a wildlife corridor on the south side of the parcel along the brook, um, which the applicant attests will not be accepted by the proposed subdivision. We talked about the stream. Uh, the Conservation Commission's feedback um, from Commission member Paige Gritton is that um, an, a request that any activity on the parcel respect and continue the wide swath of forested land that exists along the stream from Route 12 up to the west of the parcel with a recommendation for a 50-foot forested buffer along the stream for wildlife movement. Um, so we've heard that this is the area that is steeper slopes. Um, it sounds like the wildlife movement is the stream corridor, so it's a riparian wildlife corridor. Um, the setback standard that's already in the zoning is a 50-foot buffer, places some limits. Um, I, I don't know that the board will, will create a 50-foot buffer condition, but Rob, if, if that were to be a part of the conditions, would, would would you be open to a 50 foot buffer on, on your side of the stream when we can't do the opposite side of the stream? Absolutely, yeah, very very easily done, yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Um, that brings us through our standards. Um, so I will ask if um, board members have any other questions or comments. I guess uh, one question I had, uh, and this is about the uh, process we're going through right now. Why would we need to make a condition to provide a landscaping plan in the future? And wouldn't it be better just, I mean, the ordinance says that it's going to happen anyways. Um, and so it would have to be part of any future, uh, future proposal. So I, it, se it seems redundant. So Kevin, as I read it, and Meredith can definitely correct me, landscaping is one of the subdivision standards, and those standards won't be brought to bear when the next person is applying for a zoning I see. permit. I see what you're saying. Okay. And Meredith, okay. maybe Meredith. And, and, the, and the applicant in this instance is amenable to that. Yes. Uh, to that condition. Okay. Yeah. But Meredith can well, add some detail. Solved. Maybe. Yeah. Let's see if Meredith says I'm right. <laughs> so just a slight clarification on that. If the future zoning request is for either a one or a two dwelling unit development, yeah. no landscaping plan would be required at all. Once we hit a site plan version of development, right, where site plan is triggered, that's what might trigger landscaping, but we have to bump get into that. And if it's a single family home or two dwelling that's units, in, that's it doesn't different. apply. Right, and that's one reason we've been doing this for for these subdivision approvals where we're like, well, it's only two parcels. They don't know what they're doing yet. It doesn't make sense to have a landscaping plan right now. Yeah. But in yeah. future, if they decided to put two houses in here and they were right close, you know, right, but they're separate buildings, right. then it might make sense to try and add some landscaping to divide up that large meadow. Sure, but then then again, there's a, there's a procedural issue as, as, as I see it, and that is, the ordinance does not require uh, the landscaping plan for one or two. Now, in this instance, the applicant is willing to go with it, and that's you know that's great. But uh, I just want to uh, put it out there that that is not it's not a necessity for the approval. Co correct. It's not a necessity for the approval. It. I mean, it's that standard applies to all the subdivisions. So just saying we're not going to require the landscaping plan is where I get into a bit of the conundrum. Um, 
but oh, you don't it, you don't need to i mean the ordinance guides us <laughs> Right. So for, for example, the subdivision standard is that the applicant shall design the subdivision to maximize the preservation of existing mature vegetation and provide additional landscaping, which may be installed when parcels are subsequently developed as necessary to privacy, character, etc. Right. Um, and so this is the way that with a condition like that, that's the only way that we can ensure for a subdivision, a two lot subdivision that that takes place. But um, I think I hear you saying, Kevin, that that may feel like a bit of an internal contradiction, given that we can't do site plan review right. for one and two family dwellings. Yep. But well, it, it is thought, that, we can consider it in a different way because a new lot is being created. And I think that's going to be um, relevant to other subdivisions that we discussed that may be in um, higher density neighborhoods. But, well, on. I guess. Uh, obviously, we'll discuss more in deliberative session, but uh, I think that you know it's possible that the uh, preservation of 50 foot along a stream um, could be a condition that um, could uh, satisfy both um, situ situations, um, and that um, not worry about a landscaping plan condition unless um, you know we get into later where it triggers a you know site plan. Um, that's just my my two set two two cents here, given the configuration of the lot and everything like that. But obviously, we will discuss later and don't need to decide right now. That, that's okay. It's good to share some of our thinking when we can. I mean, the standard is maximize the preservation of existing mature vegetation, and there's there are more, more than one way to do that for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a question for the applicant. Sure, Joe. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was reading some of these rules here. I know you touched on this subject, but do, do you have a permit in hand from the state or you've applied for a permit, a wastewater permit from the state? Yeah, the application for a state permit acceptance will be submitted tomorrow or the following day. Um, Rob Richard is the uh, septic designer. And okay. That, you know, that process right. is underway. All right, great. Thank you. Great. All right, Rob Scott, is there anything else you'd like to add or have us know? I mean, thanks for answering questions along the way, but. Um. Yeah, no, um, it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Um, I, like I said, I don't have any plans to uh, develop the land. Um, we'd like to, you know, uh, I'll be moving. That's the whole uh, reason for the subdivision, and, mm. you know, selling the house off and, uh, but I'll be uh, coming back and I have a son in town. So oh, good. Bro, it's ends up on the field for a while and, uh, in the future, I'll, I will probably sell it off, but uh, right now I'm just going to enjoy it. Well, good, good. Glad you have some options and uh, Thank you. Glad, glad to talk with you about them. So um, since the, the way that we conduct our, deliberate, our deliberations is in a closed deliberative session. This is something that we've been doing since, uh, since going into the Zoom format as a result of the pandemic. Uh, this is, I want all applicants to know that this is something we do for all applications, no matter how straightforward or complex they may seem for the sake of taking the time to arrive at appropriate conditions and, and deliberate in a way that is not um, painful to watch on Zoom, which it can be. We think this gives more fair and higher quality decisions for the applicant, but we will get the written decision out as soon as possible after that. Um, and you, that is how you will hear about our decision. We will not be voting on it in public tonight. So this is the point where I ask someone to make a motion to close the public hearing on 2996 Elm Street and consider the application in deliberative session at the close of the public meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion by Kevin. I second. Second by Gene. All right, I'll call the roll. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Gene. Yes. Rob. Yes. Roger. Yes. Michael. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we will deliberate on this in closed session and get a written decision out as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Rob, for, for talking with us tonight and we'll be in touch. All right, thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you. Take care. Good luck with that. Thank you.
All right, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to move on to the next item in our agenda, which is for College Street. Um, this is a sketch plan for a two lot subdivision. And a sketch plan review, as many of you probably know, is a chance to discuss a proposal. We're not taking evidence tonight. We're not making any decisions. We're not swearing in witnesses. Um, it's a chance for DRB members to hear about the proposal, uh, provide a weather report as to how we see the proposal complying with the standards, um, many of which we've just discussed. Um, and it's also a chance for anyone who's interested, neighbors and otherwise, to learn about the proposal, to ask questions about the proposal. Um, and so that is what we're, we're going to do. So um, anyone who, uh, it's optional to be on camera, you can just keep listening. But if at this point, um, Therese and Peter would like to, to join the meeting by unmuting or, and or, well, unmuting and optionally joining by video. Um, I see you've unmuted, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks, so, um, oh, and Don Marsh is here as well, I assume with the applicant, is that right? Okay. Very good, thanks Don. So what we're gonna do, similar to last time, we're going to have Meredith give an overview and then we're gonna hear from the applicant. And um, at that point, I'll get a sense of how many folks might be here who, who might have questions, hello, welcome, um, about the application. And um, at that point, I'll, I'll tell you how we're gonna do Q&A, whether, whether we have um, interested parties give kind of a general statements at the beginning or throughout, okay? But rest assured that um, folks here to learn will have a chance to ask questions. All right, so um, Meredith, if you if you give a brief overview, please. Will do. Thank you, Kate. Um, so as you said, this is a sketch plan review for a two lot subdivision. Um, this is on proposed for a parcel that's on College Street as you're headed down the hill towards Berry Street, um, and it's there's. There's not a whole lot really controversial in this that, that I found in the in the in the um, review. Just about all the information is in here. Um, you know, where this is a parcel where it's really right in Montpelier. There's city water. There's city sewer, so we don't have those issues. Um, the new parcel, empty vacant parcel. Um, there's no plans for development of that right now. Um, it's bordered by two streets, so there's plenty of frontage. Um, and the, you know, there's one of the items that wasn't addressed in the application was about the public and private utilities and the um, electric. But those power and data lines run right along the side of the parcel on the side of the street that the parcel's on. So that, that really isn't going to be an issue, in my view. Um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward two parcel subdivision like we've seen in many instances right now for infill. Okay. And Meredith, since you may have the numbers handy, I will ask you, um, could you could you tell me what the two, the, the square footages of the two parcels will be? Of course. Um, so this is gonna be, this is in the residential 3000 zoning district. So every parcel has to have at least 3000 square feet. And with the subdivision, it'll end up being um, a, the first parcel, lot one, as 5,316 square feet. And the um, vacant new parcel or lot two will be 6,034 square feet. So that new parcel could theoretically hold two dwelling units. Um, or also, because every compliant parcel is allowed at least two dwelling units. Theoretically, a future developer could take that 6,000 plus square foot parcel and subdivide it further and put two more, two unit, you know, two duplexes on it. But that's further down the road. That's not something that's being proposed here. It okay. isn't in the application materials, but it's not what's being proposed. This is just a two lot subdivision with no future development plan for that new parcel. Okay, thank you, Meredith. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the applicants, Therese Mago and Peter Kelman. If you'd like to speak a little bit about, about your project, um, please go right ahead. Um, well, again, uh, it, it's pretty simple. We just want to divide our 
that corner quarter acre lot into two parcels. One, the house that we have on it, which we are in the process of trying to sell and make sure that that lot is large enough and configured in such a way that somebody who buys that would be able to put a modest addition off the back, similar to the one that we, I mean, not similar, but smaller than the one that we proposed earlier for ourselves, but out the back similarly. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, uh, the, the uh, what's right. currently a vacant lot, which is bordered by Foster and college would be able to be sold separately for development in the future. We have no plans for development. Okay, great. Um, thank you, thank you for that overview. And I apologize for any mispronunciation of, of names. Um, thank you for being here. <laughs> All right, so um, I see a couple folks who may be here to, to, um, to learn and or speak on the uh, application. Let me get a sense of that and then I can make a decision about how we'll proceed with, um, with public comment. So is it the case that um, Lisbeth Dodd and Christine Zakai are here to, to potentially speak? Yes. That's one, okay. I am curious to learn more about the application and would love to reserve the opportunity to speak or ask questions in the future as the hearing unfolds. Sounds great. We, we can do that too. And um, I see that Diane Sherman is on. Diane, do you think you um, might like a chance to speak or sort of here to listen? No, I'm just here to listen. Thank you. Very good. Great. Thanks, Diane. All right, so I think what I'd like to do is walk through the staff report because that's where we um, look at how the application lines up with our standards. It can answer a lot of questions about what the project is and isn't. And then when we get to the end, we'll be a chance for a little more back and forth, at which point I'll invite um, folks other than the applicant to, to speak up, all right? Great. Okay, so, um, so the staff report um, is available on the city's website. Um, and gives an overview of what, what we're doing here. So we've, we've heard that this is going to become two parcels and we heard about the um, square footage of the parcels being created. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start with the general standards. Again, these have most, these are most, these mostly come into play when there is something specific developed for a parcel, which as we heard is not being done at this time. Um, the, there are no specific uses proposed for lot two, um, it, but it would likely be a housing use given this, um, given the testimony that we, or the materials we've had submitted. Um, and so we know that it is, again, our job is to make sure it's suitable for a use and, and it is. Um, the dimensional standards are met, 3,000 square foot minimum, we need 45 foot minimum lot size, the maximum coverage would ultimately be up to 60% of the site. And there are also setbacks, um, density requirements that, that would need to be met. Um, we, given that no development is proposed, we anticipate that these would, would be met, that the site is an appropriate size. It's a big enough size so that these could be met by future development, okay? Um, demolition is not being proposed, that's, uh, um, 3004, section 3005, riparian areas, and 3006, wetlands and vernal pools aren't applicable here because those resources are not on the site. Um, the next item is steep slopes, section 3007. Um, and again, no proposal is being subdivided, is being, nothing's being disturbed by the drawing of lines on a map. Um, so for subdivision approval, I don't know that we need more, um, more than that. Meredith, let's see, are there slopes of over 30% or maybe this could be a question for, for Don. There are slopes, okay, sorry, top of page five of the staff report. There are slopes over 30% on the subject land, including lot two. Is that a great deal of the parcel or can you give us a sense of how much um, land is over 30%? the entire parcel um, 2,800 feet is above 30%. Um, and that comes in sort of three sections. Uh, it drops quite steeply off Foster 
down to the parcel, and then it's a gentle slope, and then there's a steep little pitch down to, uh, to within about five feet of the existing house, and then there's a little bit of steep slope on the very southern uh, part of the parcel. So those three areas total um, uh, 28.50 square feet. Okay. Thank, thank you, Don. So our zoning bylaws do not prohibit development on slopes of over 30%, but do require an engineered plan. Um, is it likely that to develop the new parcel, it would be necessary to develop on slopes of 30% or greater? Yes, I think it, one could would expect that in a, uh, an engineering plan and a road control plan would be, uh, would be necessary. Okay, thank you. Again, that's not it's not prohibitive. Um, I'm just sort of understanding the, the landscape, if you will. Okay. And so you answered about erosion control, which would be the next, the next thing. Um, do in stormwater management, um, no grades are being changed at this time because there is no proposal. Um, do board members have any questions about these, these, there, there's no specific proposal, but do you have any questions about the site and its suitability? Well, I guess, I, you know, just generally, obviously, you know, we have a slope here and there's be some sort of drainage um, considerations that would be needed for development. I just didn't know if you had a general idea just to um, kind of make sure that we we can <laughs> gauge that it's going to work. Um, yes, our, our concept would be to uh, collect the runoff on the uh, south side of the parcel, so just above uh, existing house, and then carry that out to College Street where we can connect to an existing uh, city storm drain. We can, we can make sure that there's no runoff that, that uh, leaves the parcel and goes on to a neighboring parcel. Thanks. Any other questions about st storm water from board members about st slope or stormwater erosion? All right. So um, we'll move on to section 3010, vehicular access and circulation. Um, the sketch plan, could you pull up the sketch plan for us, Meredith? I, I apologize. I didn't have that super handy. Um, That'll show us a potential area for a driveway and parking area on lot two. Um, the preliminary feedback from Public Works from Deputy Director Moitka, the potential driveway will likely not meet standard minimum distances from intersections and adjoining driveways. However, DPW would support an exemption to the standards due to relatively low traffic volumes on Foster Street. The final driveway location would need to be determined during development review, but preference would be to maximize separation from the intersection to the extent feasible. So what we're seeing here, thanks Meredith, that's really helpful. Um, on Foster Street, you can see a potential spot for a um, curb cut and um, parking area kind of in the middle of the parcel. Is, is that what we're seeing there? Correct. Okay. And is there, um, let me explain a little bit. We, we sure. started this DPW's typical standard is have it 45 feet from other driveways. Mm -hmm. Christine's driveway is sort of right on the edge of her property adjoining. So we try to keep the 45 feet um, distance. Mm -hmm. But Kurt's preliminary response was it, the way I understand it, his preference would be to be further from college and to bring the driveway back up to the uh, more toward the western edge of the parcel. Mm -hmm. I have to see you know, at this point, uh, you know, it'll be decided on what somebody builds there, but it could go either place and they seem to want to put it a little further away from, uh, from college. Okay. So, um, is, am I correct, Meredith, am I correct in saying that any place that a driveway goes on this site would require revisiting? The DRB for a waiver from the from these distance requirements. Correct. Once a and development is proposed, regulations are written right now. Mm -hmm. Any um, anything closer than forty five feet from 
the 23 Foster driveway or closer than, what did they say it was? A <laughs> hundred feet from the intersection would require DRB approval. Okay. Okay. We can't be both because of, there's only <laughs> yeah. because of math. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so I, I guess I wanted to emphasize that point so that folks who are here to learn about the application know that even if this subdivision is approved, the conversation about the appropriate location of the driveway would take place again once, when and if a development is proposed. Okay. Um, Great. Okay. That, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so parking and loading areas are the next set of standards that, that we look at to provide adequate off street parking in this zoning district. Each dwelling unit requires at least one off street parking spot. And that is indicated on the site plan as we just saw. Um, and again, technically nothing's being proposed. So we are just kind of hypothetically thinking, could this site accommodate what it needs to? Um, signs not applicable. Okay, I'm so, curious. Uh, yeah, Gene, go ahead. Any, I'm curious to know on Foster Street, is there an existing uh, public street parking there right now, currently? Oh, is there on street? The parcel. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's some on street parking for Foster Street. Foster. Okay. All right. That's good to know. So great. So any questions, other questions from board members about the general standards we've just gone through? Okay, and um, anything that the applicants, anything else the applicants would like to add? Okay, that, that's fine. I like to just pause and slow down once in a while so I don't forget to give you a chance, but. All right, we'll, we'll keep moving. So the next set of standards are the subdivision standards. Um, that, that we go through to make sure the addition of a lot and eventual construction on that lot are um, compatible with the neighborhood and the ability of the city to provide services and maintain safety and things like that. So that's what we're moving on to next. So um, section 3502 is the capacity of community facilities and utilities. And um, again, local schools, police, fire protection, ambulance service, infra street infrastructure and maintenance, parks and recreation facilities, water supply, sewage disposal, stormwater. Um, and the narrative says that um, even if lot two were developed to the greatest density allowed under the current regulations for a to two split into two parcels with two units each for a total of four, um, there would be only a modest impact on the school's fire, police, and ambulance service. That's an if, that's a hypothetical, not being proposed, but it helps us as a board think about what, um, what the impact would be. And the uh, applicant attests that future development would connect to existing water and sewer mains. That, that makes sense given its location. In fact, it would be required. <laughs> so good that those are there. Um, any questions about impact on community facilities and utilities from board members or any other, inf again, this is sketch plan review. So is there anything additional you would want to learn about or know before doing the final review here? Okay, great. So then um, suitability of the land. Um, we don't want to create a hazard, a lot that is going to be a hazardous lot to use. Um, do board member we, we talked about slopes we talked about erosion um, are there any other questions about the suitability of this land for um to be its own parcel from board members okay great um so then we look we go on to traffic subdivision standard from section 3504 um, and the, the need to demonstrate that the proposed subdivision will not have an undue adverse effect upon traffic in the area. This is a standard that acknowledges that any change is going to have some effect. It's our job to make sure that the standard will, or that the change will not be unduly adverse. Okay. Um, does it, and so again, we, the subdivision itself does not generate traffic. Um, but again, if we think about a maximum build out of that parcel, um, it, it is probably a relatively minimal amount of, of traffic and movement that would not completely 
debilitate College Street or, or Foster Street. Um, again, that, that's the sort of thing that would be reviewed um, if, if there were a th this would be reviewed if there were three or four units proposed, not if there were one or two units proposed. Um, so this would be a good time if board members have any questions about the, the traffic. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm deliberately going slow, but we can go back to any of these things too. Um, so the next item is design and configuration of the parcel boundaries. And um, from, from what we've seen on the site plan, this is basically making a corner lot um, on Foster and College. And it appears to be, you know, jumping ahead a little to character of the neighborhood, it appears to be a proposed corner lot that is not unlike the other corner, three corner lots at the intersection of Foster and College. Is it Foster over onto the other side too? It's a different street, it's okay. <laughs> Didn't want to misspeak and make up neighborhoods here. Um, I have one question. Yeah, um, go ahead, sure, Rob. Can we get a little more information on the configuration of the division line? Um, I think I'm looking at the one that's got a couple angle points versus the one, other one that's on the site plan or the site, the slope sketch, but um, Okay, I see the, what would we call that? A mini panhandle in the upper left there. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, mini panhandle. Yeah, good question. Why, why is that the case? That's put in there to enable the existing house to put uh, up to a 20 foot long uh, uh, addition out the back and still uh, observe the setbacks between okay. It and the new property. Okay. I mean, I just one, you know, one suggestion, maybe it's not possible and you've gone through every single configuration, but uh, I, I just didn't know if there's a way to, um, to go from that 13 foot um, um, line, uh, you know, all the way out straight out to the street um, somehow. Um, maybe you guys know the configuration better than I do, but uh, it just, it seems like obviously you gotta have some nooks in it, but the, uh, Unless that uh, I don't know, does it follow the slope or something? Is there is there a natural feature that goes along that line? With the thirteen foot uh, line out to the street, what do you mean? Oh, uh, do you mean out to out to um, um, College Street? So you have a seven foot diagonal uh, section in the middle there. I just didn't know if there was a way to uh, yeah. to re to remove that and makes it make it a little bit more uniform. But maybe the way that uh, it looks out there with the slope, it's uh, it kind of follows the slope. I don't I don't know. I'm just sort of uh giving you my two, my two cents of what it looks like on the plan well in order to get the number of square feet into okay. the lot we we need we, we if we straighten that out then we lose square footage and we wouldn't have six thousand square feet okay okay thank you it's a good reason <laughs> thank you for the observation and the explanation that is helpful um, okay, other questions about um, from board members about lot arrangement, dimensions, configuration. Okay. Um, so we're going through a few more standards and then we'll have a chance for, um, for questions from folks who've joined us to learn more. Um, so design and layout of necessary improvements. There are no new streets. Um, you'll be hooked up that any future development on the new parcel will be hooked up to town water or city water and wastewater, um, fire protection. Um, DPW has not requested additional fire hydrants. This is in a settled neighborhood. So presumably, okay, there's a page nine of the staff report shows that there's a uh, fire hydrant just uphill. Okay. Um, Public and private utilities, all utilities shall be located underground unless present, prevented by ledge or other physical conditions or where the subdivision is in a section of street with existing above ground utilities and burial would not be practicable. Um, this will be addressed when buildings are proposed, though um, there are existing above ground utilities, so the need to bury them is, is unlikely. Um, 
Meredith, do you, you have some comments on that? Do you have anything beyond what I just said that you want to flag here? No, just, I mean, it's, it's one of those situations where if they were to go underground, it would just be that for that one little distance from the street to the house because of like the homeowner's desire really in, in this neighborhood, most of these utilities are connecting directly to houses. Um, you know, but on the other hand, unlike some subdivisions, we wouldn't have, you know, there wouldn't be the issue of having to dig up the street to get the utilities to be underground from the main line to the house. I, I, I just, I don't see it as being an issue for this parcel. Okay, thanks. Board members, do you have anything to add or comment on related to utilities? All right. Um, so landscaping, um, we just dis we discussed this a little in the previous a lot in the previous application, which is um, when the subdivision is is being done, we ask that the applicant design the subdivision to maximize the preservation of existing mature vegetation, and provide additional landscaping, which may be installed when lots are subsequently developed as necessary. Um, to maintain and provide privacy, to enhance the appearance of street frontages and shade trees and sidewalks, um, to maintain or establish vegetated buffers along waterways. There's no, no waterway there. Um, and the narrative of this states that the landscaping would be addressed by subsequent property owner when buildings are proposed. And um, that could be, in, in the final review, that could be a condition that this board requests um, be part of the application um, to ensure that once the development happens, that that happens. Would that would that be okay with 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 you? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Parks and recreation facilities is not um, applicable. The sketch plan shows existing monuments and corner markers. Um, for any new monuments or corner markers, those would just need to be on the final the final plat that you submit. Um, all right, so then the last, um, almost last standard is the character of the neighborhood and settlement pattern. So um, this is to ensure fit within a neighborhood. And I'll, I'll just read for the, for the benefit of us all, the College Hill neighbor, it's the College Hill South neighborhood in our zoning. And it's, described as primarily residential with homes located on small parcels along narrow tree-lined streets. Proposed development should protect the historic character and appeal of this neighborhood while allowing for a moderate increase in residential density through compatible infill development, particularly with compact buildings and conversion of existing buildings to multi-unit occupancy. Um, the applicant's testimony is that a new parcel here is consistent with this settlement pattern. And uh, as, we've, as we've seen, it's similar to the other three corners of that intersection. Um, but we can talk, do, do um, DRB members have any questions or thoughts about the neighborhood compatibility character of the area? Pretty straightforward. Okay, great. So similarly, um, renewable energy and energy conservation, um, mm -hmm making sure not to, to, to leave adequate opportunity for um, conservation, including solar installation and such. And the narrative um, does address this directly. The lot layout will accommodate a solar system. A solar system? Sounds very, <laughs> its own set of planets, its own moon and everything. Um, a lot bigger a, a than we thought. This, this is really, really, this is an incredible lot. <laughs> yeah. um, probably solar energy system and it's expected that any building construction on the parcel will utilize energy conservation construction practices. And the natural slope means that the existing house at Fort College will be less apt to impede the solar access. So the downhill lot will not impede the solar access of the uphill lot, That's that makes sense. Okay, so these, these are the standards that we go through in deciding whether this meet, meets our zoning bylaw. And, and we've, we've sort of been through the the flags and the questions and the conditions of the site. So what I'm gonna do is see if board members have any more questions and then I'm gonna turn it over um, to those who've been waiting patiently and would um, like to ask any, any questions or make any comments. So starting with board members, any, any uh, now that you've seen the whole picture, we've discussed it, any questions or comments? 
Well, I guess just a general, uh, I guess, comment. I wanted to make sure that the applicants were aware, um, based on sort of explanation here, of the um, the provision of the rent for the infill development um, density bonuses. Um, planning developments where you have um, there's a section of the regs that allows for you to get a density bonus and reduce uh, lot size requirements uh, and setbacks um, for um, if you meet certain cri certain criteria um, under a plan unit development. I believe is that not in the regs anymore, Meredith? Just can't hear you. Yeah, there you go. It is in the regs, um, but. I don't remember which of any of these. Um, it, it it may. I don't know how many of these are applicable to this particular parcel. Um, I guess the infill housing development PUD might be a possibility. I just wanted to flag it as a possible consideration. It seems like the description already checked off a couple of the uh, boxes that get them uh, some bonuses there. So uh, I just was going to bring it up, but maybe it's, it's yeah, more, that, more time they're going to do. Yeah, no, that, that is a possibility. I mean, to get above anything above four dwelling units um, on any parcel is going to require a conditional use review. Right. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, it's for, th there are possibilities. I would have to look and, and run it through all the, the math to see how far that density bonus would, would get anybody under the PUD versus being able to just develop it with split it in two and have two units on each parcel. I don't know how much benefit it would get them or any future developer. I guess the, the benefit that jumped out to me was the uh, was the setback um, and uh, partial configuration uh, variances, uh, which would happen at this point. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe may, may be helpful, maybe not. That's what right. jumped out to me. Well, um, since you raised that, Rob, thank you, um, Meredith. Would you mind giving us a page reference on the infill housing PUD provision of the bylaw? Yep. So that's on page three dash seven five. Okay. The unified regs. Yeah. Um, it's section three four zero one. Okay, three four zero one, and what a PUD that stands for planned unit development, and it's a compre more comprehensive approach to development that can in in this case if you do certain things to promote infill housing, so the use of a lot that is currently underutilized, whether there's something on it or not, if you do certain things, you can have some additional flexibility beyond what the regulations would otherwise provide. So when we're saying PUD, that's that's what that means. Um, and often you see these used in rural areas where you might get bonus density by leaving more open space, for example, but there are ways to do it in downtown too. So this does not directly apply to our review of the subdivision regulations and whether or not you meet the standards, but as far as thinking what, what is possible for the future owner of this lot um, and how the parcel boundaries might affect that. I, I think, I guess it, it might be worth reading that section of the regulation and see if that changes the way you want to do the lot configuration. Is that what you're getting at, Rob? Yeah, just consideration, yeah. Okay, but it's all, it's all in the discussion phase at the moment, so that's why we're bringing it up. Oh. Um, the other term that we just used was conditional use review, and that is for when something is developed that doesn't just get a straight permit from the um, from Meredith from the from the planning office, but when it requires a level of review that's above and beyond that, it would come to this board again to again ensure compatibility with the neighborhood. So, there's your your zoning 101 for the evening. Thanks for thanks for humoring me there. All right, again, with, with, thank you to those of you who have been listening and um, really want to give you a chance to ask questions. So, without further ado, um, I think. Um, I think Christine signed on first. Is that right, Meredith? I don't know if you're keeping track. So maybe uh, it, it was. I, I think Christine and Diane were on earlier, and Liz came in after. But okay. So we'll we'll do that. We'll do Christine, Diane, if she'd like, and then Elizabeth, and that ends up being uh, alphabetical as well. So, um, Christine, if you'd like, you're you're welcome to just have listened or you're welcome to post some questions and um, 
I'll just, uh, oh, just turn it over to you for comments. Okay, thank you. Um, um, so in regards to storm water, um, it, uh, Don, um, I didn't, you mentioned that storm water would be directed to the south to exit onto a street, and I didn't hear the name of the street that you articulated. Were you saying College Street? College Street. We collect what? I can't hear you. Uh, we collected along the southern edge of the new lot and directed to the east to existing city infrastructure uh, along College. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so then I'm also just curious about, um, in regards to parking, given that the intent is um, to, you know, eventually yield a lot that can be developed and um, potentially subdivided again um, into two, it sounds like, folks are thinking about two duplexes, um, which would then require four parking spaces. Um, I'm curious about how those setbacks can be satisfied. And I understand that this is not part of the subdivision conversation right now, but given that we are already talking about parking and that, um, you know, that this vision for this lot is on the table right now. I'm curious about how um, that those parking needs would be satisfied in that scenario. Um, again, it's, it would be more appropriate on the actual development phase, but we've done some preliminary work that- I'm sorry, Don, I can't quite hear you. Be more- I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, we'll try it. Can you hear me now? Yes, you sound a little far away, Don, but um, we'll all listen. Maybe I'm just spacing. Um, we have, it doesn't seem to be applicable at this point. We just need that one parking space, but we've done some preliminary designs that would allow us to be able to get easily two and potentially four parking spaces off Foster. Yeah. It would be in anticipation of um, the units having both a parking space and probably an attached garage. So you get a space in, in each or a garage that would be underneath a portion of the house. So there is plenty of room if, if need be to get four spaces off Foster. Thanks, Thanks Don. And Christine, you're welcome to go ahead with, a, with a, some more questions if you, or comments if you have them. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, zoning regulations may have changed. Certainly, the DRB has changed in the past couple of years. But I'm just curious. Um, in 2016, when um, at, and again, I'm so I'm at 23 Foster, so the adjoining neighbor. When um, I applied to um, seek uh, one. Um, permeable parking space to develop one additional permeable parking space, gravel parking space. The DRB had really significant concerns about creating that additional parking space um, and as well um, impervious surfaces. And I'm just curious about, you know, what level of, whether that's current a priority for the DRB, you know, whether, you know, maybe regulations, the, the zoning regs have changed since 2016, but um, I'm just curious, it's it's a, a marked contrast from my experience when, um, you know, we sought to develop like one additional parking space. The regulations have changed. I can't, um, I can't cite chapter and verse, <laughs> unfortunately, to say how. 
it's possible that the coverage amounts changed. Um, the the maximum coverage of of the lots in this neighborhood are sixty percent impervious cover, and it's possible that that was a different or different lower percentage in the previous version. And Meredith, I don't know if you feel comfortable. Um, speaking to that or if this would be better to have a conversation about um, separately when when you've had a chance to look into it a little bit more and you could you could loop back with Christine or um, yeah, but I, I, mean, I appreciate the point that, that you're making that you're sort of like what are, what are the standards and how, how is this measured and what's different now that might have been different then yeah I because I came in um, like five months after we went into the 2018 standards um, I've had very limited work with those older standards. I'm guessing that there was a change to impervious surface maximums. Um, and so, I mean, you and I can talk separately because it, it may be that now there wouldn't be an issue with you getting that additional parking space. Because um, I mean, I'm looking at your parcel right now. I think that's your parcel. Um, yeah. And it doesn't look like you have anywhere near 60% coverage. So um, I, I, I think it is just a different standard issue. But we can, I can look back at the old 2016 standards if you want. No, that's OK. I mean, and again, I'm not trying to bring up an old, you know, an old issue that's already been resolved. I'm just curious about the, like, the city's priorities and how they're reflected in the zoning standards. And if the priorities have changed around impervious surfaces, water quality runoff. I mean, it sounds like that's just not the, a priority in the way it was before. I would want, I would suggest you actually talk to the planning director, Mike Miller, who's been here a long time. Um, it, I think it was also a situation of, in the revision in 2018, making sure that um, the impervious surface limits and the issues around that were district specific like those new district lines were drawn with these standards like how much impervious surface should be allowed in that district for as a percentage of a parcel you know th those were considerations so those impervious surface maximums change greatly depending on where in the city the parcel is located um, so we can have that discussion yeah. separately and, and bring in mike on that Good. but I, I know that you know stormwater is in some ways more carefully monitored under these zoning regs in that once development is actually proposed where we see what's happening with a a project we have to see a stormwater plan you know even a single family co home going in we need to see what you're doing with the stormwater so it's a mix of different ways of regulating i don't think it's any less of a priority though Okay, thank you. And just so that I understand the current regulations, it's 60% impervious cover. That's right. Max 60% maximum of the lot. I was that's right. 60% okay. maximum of the lot in this zoning district. In this okay. zoning district, right. Right, right. Okay, yeah, super. Um, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for your questions. Um, I wanna give Diane the opportunity to comment if she'd like. I don't have any questions or comments, thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Diane. All right, so moving on um, to Elizabeth, if you'd like to ask questions or make some comments for a few minutes, go right ahead. I'm, I appreciate the lateness of the hour, and I'm wondering if you have another um, piece of business after this one. I don't wanna, I feel I probably will take about 10 to 15, 10 to 15 minutes, and I really appreciate your time. So I am serious. Do you have business oh, after you. this? Well, thanks. Thanks for helping us plan ahead a little bit. You know, my I would um, I would like to limit. I think we just took about five or six minutes with um, Christine's comments, and so I would ask that um, as a as a threading the needle between the lateness of the hour and wanting to make sure you're heard, if you could take five or six minutes and and share your thoughts, um, that that would. Uh, okay, then I would like to be reassured that there is going to be another opportunity that this is not the final review. This is just a discussion. That's right. This is okay, a the reason I'm coming review. from and that so is. Let, let me okay. clarify one more thing okay, before exactly. you go on. Um, th so we're actually not taking, this is not testimony at this time. This is a back and forth. This is a weather report. Okay. This is a learning. Um, so as, as, you, as you probably know, um, 
people can go ahead and submit written comments. That can be a really good way to be heard in advance of a hearing, and that also helps DRB members, as well as the applicant, have advance notice of what might be of concern. So this is the discussion. Um, if you want to frame it up as written comments before the final application, you could. But if you'd like to give us a preview or get some questions asked, uh, questions answered now, this would be perfect time for that to take five, five or six minutes. Okay, and so uh, just that there's enough advance notice to write some things up. And all right, I've been uh, at 14 College Street, which is on the corner of College and Foster. I call it a nondescript little ranch house. It's right on the corner. I've been there, a homeowner there for over 10 years. And if um, I don't, if you have not walked in this area, if you have not personally walked in this neighborhood and walked down the street and see this property, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. It's very important. And to my knowledge, it's one of the last open lots in the South, in the South College area. It's also one that's highly used um, by deer and by wildlife that go through here. And I know Peter can testify to that. It's kind of most a lot of neighbors who've lost a lot of veggies over the years. So it's not just us, it's our coexistence with other, other things in the area. All right, so um, it is one of the last parcels. And so I'm really concerned about it. I'm also con particularly concerned about stormwater and parking. Um, as you walk down Foster Street, it's very limited. And you'll see that when you take a walk, and particularly now when we have opposite sides of the street parking, you want to take a close look at that. There's really few, if any, other places to park on College Street, except on my lawn, frankly. And so now people are parking on my lawn because there isn't another place to park on Foster Street. And so when we're thinking of adding up to two to four cars and that parking there, I really am concerned about where are people going to park. Um, also, if you haven't stood and when I come out of my driveway, you really have to be careful. You will come during rush, quote unquote, rush hour during normal times and see what it takes to get out of out of onto College Street. And I know Peter uh, can testify to this. Um, I'm about the only person right now, um, except for Peter, Peter, who drives onto College Street and tries to back onto College Street. And if you have four more people who are going to be backing onto College Street during high rush hour times, it's going to be a real issue. People come up from down up on the hill. And um, so it's really a potential. And if you haven't had, um, you know, a traffic, real traffic study done on this, I'd really suggest it um, because there's been a lot of close calls. Uh, so that's one thing. And I'll try to uh, limit it. Um, uh, I, I attended the last hearing when um, they proposed an extension on their house, and I'm trying to uh, recall, but I think they said that um, they were going to develop up on this upper lot that they're now proposing, but they couldn't do it because of the cost that would be involved, and I think it was um, water that would have to align that would have to go across onto College Street and rip up the new sidewalk the city just installed a couple of years ago. And so it was cost prohibitive to, for them to do that. So then they build off the back of their house. So I'm wondering now when you're going to add up to four more units on there, where is this line going to go and will that impact tearing up the brand new sidewalk because that's what they had found from their designer was going to happen last time. Um, uh, it is a very steep slope. Uh, when my house was built, you can look in the basement, the buttresses that they put in down there because of the stope, slope and the wastewater runoff. If you come after a heavy rain, you stand out in front of my lawn on College Street. It's a river that comes down College Street. It's not a quiet little stream. It's a big river. Um, and I'm not a specialist in that area, but take a close look at it. So um, ambulance and uh, fire departments, um, availability to access those houses. I'm wondering what they think about it. Um, and I'd be real curious to see design in there. Uh, erosion control, 
Um, so those are my, some of my big concerns. One would be the character of the neighborhood. I have a master's in natural resource planning. I have a master's in history, and I've done a lot of work in historic preservation. So this, my background and my training and my experience, and as a homeowner and a really lover of this community, a lot of flags go up for me when you take a look at this. And it sounds really nice when you go through the standards, but you have to really take a look and come to, come to know the area. Um, so I guess that's it for now. Um, but if you haven't walked this neighborhood, make sure you do it because it's the last open lot in this area. We can say, okay, well, it meets all the standards. However, um, as far as livability, I think that's really open to question. And by the way, I've been there 10 years and the loss of trees. Um, we talk about tree lined streets. There aren't tree lined streets anymore. We have lost a lot of trees. And um, it's just on Foster Street, on the other side of Foster Street, um, it's, it's, it makes a lot, it's a creeping um, of a change in this neighborhood. So I guess that's it for now. I've, that's been about four to five minutes. I appreciate your time, but really give strong consideration as far as what's going on. It's not, it, so anyway, you can tell I'm concerned. Right. Well, thanks for laying those out. This is the time to do it. And it's important that everybody hears those. Um, this is the point where, um, okay, so everyone who's wanted to be heard on this has, uh, neighbors questions have had the chance. So um, I'd like to turn it back to the applicant if there's anything that, that they'd like to add, um, if, I, if I may put you on the spot. And um, if, if there's anything that you want to clarify about the proposal or, or anything else, it doesn't have to be full, full response, but this is a chance for discussion leading up to the final application, the final testimony. Again, this is all discussion. None of this is testimony. You can change your mind. You can change your design. You can change your concerns. It's true for everyone. But I will, um, I'll just turn it over to the applicant to answer, answer some of the questions that have been raised, if you choose. Or um, just very, um, just to reiterate, uh, we're just asking for a subdivision here. We're not doing any development. Uh, any development that would be done, whether it was for one, two, or four units, would come before the board and citizenry and the neighbors at that time. We have no plans to develop it ourselves. Um, in fact, we are offering the house for sale with the lot for anybody who wants to keep the lot open or to use it in whatever way they want. That's not what we're uh, asking for here. Um, questions of parking uh, obviously would have to be addressed uh, when any building might take place. Uh, but let me just clarify one thing for Liz. There will be no, no people backing into College Street if they're backing at all, it would be onto Foster Street. But again, that's a question of uh, a, a developer designing a driveway and a parking area. Um, uh, uh, the, the parking along Foster Street is very limited, um, but so is housing in Montpelier. We, we, we would like to make this lot, which is basically uh, a field with slopes open to a developer who might be able to build some more housing in Montpelier. And by the way, it is not the only lot, open lot in our neighborhood by, by, by a long shot. Unmute, okay. Well, thank you. So that kind of that kind of lays out the the landscape of what we're considering. Um, any last questions from uh, board members before we wrap up um, this this sketch plan discussion? <clears throat> okay. Um, very good. I think we've done that pretty thoroughly. So um, as I said before, I'll say one more time. This was a discussion um, when this comes before the board for final review, that is the point at which we would swear in witnesses and take testimony. That testimony can be given orally or in writing prior to the meeting. Um, the same sort of rules of, it would be a more formal process. So it's more like the, the two to four minute comment period um, at the final hearing compared to the sort of discussion that we had tonight, just so that people can can plan and, and find ways to, to make their comments heard in advance if desired. 
um, and that hearing will take place at the, at the pleasure of the applicant when they decide they are ready to proceed, but um, public notice will be given. Um, all right, I think that brings our discussion of, of this application to, or this not application, this sketch plan conversation to a close. Um, Thank you, Kate. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you all for, for being here and engaging, engaging in some good discussion. I appreciate it. All right, so um, back to my agenda here. Going to move on. Where is my agenda? I've lost my agenda. Um, I, I, I believe the only thing we have is uh, other business. Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, other business, our, regular, our next regularly scheduled meeting is for February 1st, but we do not have any business on that day, and so the meeting is canceled. We will not have a DRB meeting on February 1st, which will make our next meeting, I believe, February 15th, unless, no, 16th because of President's Day. Exactly, Tuesday, right. February 16th. Okay, so... Mark your calendars. We'll be off cycle just a little bit, but it'll be about a month from today when we come back together. All right. Is there any other other business or announcements? Okay. In that case, I will accept a motion to adjourn the public hearing into deliberative session. Uh, oh, adjourn the public hearing and move into deliberative session. You said it all. Uh, I will. Uh... I, I will offer that uh, motion. Thank you, Kevin. Is there a second? Second. Second from Gene. The call the roll. Joe. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Gene. Yes. Rob. Yes. Roger. Yes. Michael. Yes. Are we getting a separate link on uh, the Gmail or? Uh, I, uh, I just sent it. Okay. If you want to wait for a minute to finish the roll so people actually get the email, then yeah. <laughs> and and I things, also things are I also... starting to get very, very funky here. Um, I'm losing, losing you guys. So okay, yeah. I vote. I vote yes. The motion carries. Um. All right. Um. Let's come back together in three minutes to um for the deliberative session. <laughs>